With a bit of luck, that will now come up on the screen. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah. Um, it means I can't draw on the iPad, so I'm going to have to wave dramatically towards the screen and hope you understand it at various stages. All right? um, I thought I'd start off with this just to give you a sense of where this, this talk is going to come from. Yeah? Um, I've used variations of this slide on many, many occasions. And it's really an attack on the dominant thing you see in a lot of agile conferences and also organizational development conferences, which thinks if you just get everybody sorted out and their mindset right, magically things will happen. Right? The reality is, if you don't have processes, it won't happen anyway. And you can't rely on your organization being made up of highly gifted people. One of the clear characteristics, and I do a lot of military work, in fact, one of the things I'm proud of, if you saw it on LinkedIn, um, an agile coach who's now a Ukrainian officer actually published an article yesterday about how he'd used his agile learning to actually make a difference in the Ukrainian fight, and that's worth looking at on LinkedIn, yeah? And that's using Canavian framework and other material. But fundamentally, it's not about individuals, it's about process. What the army do is they take ordinary people and they make them extraordinary by good process and good training. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of that aspect. I'm going to mix theory with practice. I'm also going to introduce you to some natural science, some stuff that we know from natural science, which actually contradicts a lot of the things that the Agile movement does. Not that it was wrong when it started, but kind of like science moves on, and as it does move on, we should use that understanding try, rather than trying to reject it. So the conversation here, and this is where I'm now trying to see if it does work. No, it's not working. It's all right, I'll do it on here. So the, the title of this is Rewilding. Now, the rewilding concept in eco ecosystems isn't about going back to the past. It's about restoring balance. The other phrase I'm going to use a lot is trying to go for renaissance, not enlightenment. And for those of you who know your history, the renaissance was a rediscovery of past knowledge as well as an exploration of new knowledge. It combined the two. Whereas the enlightenment model was to throw everything out and transform, that terrible word. Yeah? If you start a transformation program, you are, I'm afraid to say, doomed to fail. Right? Uh, it doesn't really work except in really exceptional circumstances when there's a major crisis. Then you can get people to radically change, but on a day-to-day -day basis in general not, which doesn't mean that there isn't a different approach to change, and I want to focus on that. So the rewilding concept is about restoring balance, and this is an example of you know, a timber wolf which is fairly close to the original canines, uh, you've all seen these pictures. Uh, we're trying to reintroduce them or get them reintroduced into Scotland because of the deer problem. They're an apex predator. They're quite important. When man comes along and domesticates dogs, something rather scary happens over five generations, and you get this. Now, if you want a metaphor for where Agile is at the moment, that's it. We went from something rather wild and exciting, which might make a difference, into a series of highly domesticated suboptimal species, which require far too much care and attention to maintain. I should, by, by the way, tell you that I am owned by cats. I mean, and I've said many times that cat, people owned by cats understand complexity. People who want to own dogs are trying to ignore it, but that's a story for another day, right? Um, but the rewilding concept is we need to get some of the original material actually back into the system. So what I'm going to do is to basically start with this image. This is the image of a potter. Now, a potter is a craftsman or a craftswoman. And we need to start to think about the whole concept of craft in what we do as a software industry. And we need to remember that it's not very old. Just to give you my own background, yeah. um, I did a degree in physics and philosophy. You're going to see that come through as we go through. From a physicist's point of view, no social scientist ever has enough data to form any valid conclusion anyway, and nobody taking an empirical approach to agile design really has a complete lack of scientific understanding because their samples are even less. Yeah. But I had that. I worked in the World Council of Churches on the program to combat racism. That was wonderfully exciting for a period. 
including going backwards and forwards to Berlin every eight weeks and ended up naked in a Stasi cell one night. There are stories around this from the 70s were a lot of fun, yeah? Uh, you knew you were safe if you were British or French or American in Berlin in those days. So that was the way it worked. But one of the key things that I learned all the way through that is that a craft is a combination of theory and practice. The craftsman has served their time, they've served their apprenticeship. And I'll make a statement now. I've worked in method development all my life. I've yet to create a robust method in less than five years. Yeah, you start with the theory, you explore the practice, you modify, you revise, and then you can scale. I'm seeing people in Agile now literally reading a couple of books which they don't fully understand, throwing together a method, throwing together a certificate, and thinking that's authentic. And we really, I get into trouble sometimes for calling this out, but those of us who need to call it out because it's actually quite dangerous. It's the trivialization of what should be a craft. The craftsman not only learns their apprenticeship over time, but they understand the nature of clay, the nature of water. They have theoretical knowledge. This is what Aristotle called pronesis and sophia. Without practical wisdom, nothing makes sense. Without theoretical wisdom, nothing scales. And to make a very clear point, if you don't know why something worked, repeating it is actually quite dangerous because the context may have shifted and you may get badly caught out. So we need to actually have a mixture of theory and practice. And the general concept for what I work on, this is one of five established schools, if you look at the academic literature, is what's called naturalizing sense-making. And whether you have a hyphen or not actually matters. The, uh, the philosophy in me, philosopher in me is very pedantic about language, right? If you have a hyphen, it's a verb. If you don't have a hyphen, it's a noun. And sense-making for me is how do we make sense of the world so that we can act in it? So it carries with it that concept of sufficiency. You never know everything you would like to know, but you have to act anyway. And part of the major problem with modern software development is that we've done so much on the routine transaction side of things. We're now exploring areas where users have no idea what the technology can do. So there are major issues in a traditional approach to user requirements definition. And fundamentally, if I was in Scrum, I would get rid of the product owner category completely. And I'm going to come back to that and explain why in a minute or two. Yet we need something which is far more co-evolutionary and far more adaptive because we're dealing with far more inherent uncertainty. The naturalizing in the phrase there says to bring things back to the natural science, the point I just made. And to be clear, we use natural science as what is called an enabling constraint. So there are things we know about human cognition. There are things we know about culture. If you don't know it, we now know the biological mechanism by which culture inherits. So we know it's a biological phenomenon, it's not just a sociological phenomenon. The nature of the symbolic language you speak to your children is inherited by your grandchildren. If you don't know about this, read up on epigenetics, one of the most fascinating areas in biology at the moment. We're discovering all sorts of things in science which allow us to say human beings make, do not make decisions in a rational, structured way. Come back to that in a minute. They make decisions in a very different way. Klein, myself, and others are basically saying there's no such thing as a cognitive bias. You should stop thinking about it that way. They're cognitive heuristics. They've evolved because actually overall for the species, they work. So you're not going to change them. So you work with them rather than trying to work against them. And really what I'm arguing for in a wider sense is that we need to shift away from the sort of manufacturing framing of software development into something which is far more service relationship. I'm now in my third software startup. Uh, two were internal to large companies. Uh, SenseMaker is my own within Cognitive Edge. I've always been in application software development, and I've always been developing software for things for which there was no market demand but I was pretty convinced we could create it. And that actually is a major area in both software and hardware development. Apple are really good at it, uh, much more successful than I am. 
Um, they basically make things you didn't know you wanted till you've got them, then you can't do without them. And that's a different type of relationship in terms of the way we need to work. So I started to work in software development, building decision support systems for Guinness International, which was an interesting experience, because if you remember your history, and some of you are probably not old enough, they got into a lot of trouble, and the CEO got sent to prison because they did illegal acquisitions. I wrote the systems which did the financial calculations that they used for that. Um, so that was an interesting period in my life. But I'd been a financial director, a deputy financial director, before I moved into software. I kind of like knew what their job was. So I ignored everything they said they wanted, and I wrote what I thought they needed. And I got it right. Yeah, it was a result to which I got promoted and ended up as strategy director. Sometimes you make those calls. But the reality is they were asking me to replicate what they already did manually. They didn't realize the potential for doing things in a different way. Right, so I'm going to come back to some rad radically different methods and approaches to actually fill in the backlog. And I'll say up front, Scrum is one of the best software techniques I've ever seen for making complex things complicated when you've already got an idea of what you should deliver. But it's a very bad set of methods for the truly complex. And so I'm going to talk about three different approaches to generating backlog. Yeah, so the idea here, I'm going to finish on this, we need to get to extracting elements from all of the frameworks and all of the methods and combine them in different ways, yeah, rather than lock ourselves into one structure or the actual framework wars. So that's the kind of like broad principle. Because I haven't got the iPad, I can't see the next slide, so there may be some random stuff here. Right. So let's do some core science. This is a famous one. You get a group of radiologists, and you give them a batch of x-rays, and you ask them to look for anomalies. On the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. 83% of radiologists will not see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. And the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talk with the 83% who didn't. This is called inattentional blindness. Yeah? Part of the problem we have as an industry is most people in IT are towards the autistic end of the spectrum, so you're more likely to see the gorilla, and that's a problem when you design systems, because your users are less likely. But it's also a huge opportunity. There are things out there we haven't found. To explain why this is the case, the most anybody in this room scans of available data, if you're really focused and really concentrating, is about 5%. Most of the time, it's 2 to 3%. That then triggers a series of memories. And just to be clear, we now know that consciousness is a distributed function of the brain, the body, and its social interactions. If the brain dies, your consciousness goes, but consciousness is not confined to the brain, which is why we hate phrases like mental models and mindset, because they're really old ways of thinking about the problem. So either way, you've matched, say, 3 or 4% of the data. It triggers a series of memories, cognitive, physical, social. You blend those together. It's called conceptual blending. And the first blended pattern, which appears to fit, you apply. So you do a first fit pattern match, not a best fit pattern match. Which means you generally don't see things that you don't expect to see. All right? Now, the evolutionary reason for this is fairly self-evident. If you think about the hurly hominoids in the savannas of Africa, and something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed, do you want to autistically scan all available data, look up a catalogue of the flora and fauna of the African continent, and having identified lion, look at best practice case studies in how to avoid lions. You know, by that time, the only document of use seal would be the book of Jonah from the Old Testament, which is the only example I've found of an escape manual from the digestive tract of a large carnival uh, written by somebody who claims to have done it. We evolved to make decisions very, very quickly based on a partial data scan privileged in our most recent experiences. And once you realize that, there's a whole body of things that you have to do differently. What's interesting is you can use ritual to trigger change. 
We've been doing experiments to actually get coders to go through, change their clothes before they test. And if you do that on a regular basis, the ritual means a different 5% is brought into play to do the scanning. If you actually think about it, when you get in a car to drive, you go through little rituals. And you're changing the cognitive activation pattern so that you see the world in a different way. And that's all about energy efficient and energy reduction. So if that's the case, we need to start to look at things from many backgrounds and we need to find the 17% before they talk to the 83%. And again, in software design, that's critical because that may be the opportunity yet which we would otherwise miss. So that's kind of like science fact number one of six, but I'm going to give you a break before I go on to four to six. Next one. How many of you got children? You tell them bedtime stories? Do the bedtime stories follow the form of Janet and John stayed at home, did what mummy and daddy said, conformed with the scrum guide, achieved the family KPIs, had a common purpose and a common value system, so everything worked out. Anybody tell those sort of stories? <laughs> yeah. Just to depress you, there are consultants in Texas who are doing that for families, all right? But I also wasn't allowed to talk about evolution because it was a controversial theory and I was working with the Ebola management team. So that is kind of like really scary if you think about it. Yeah? The stories we tell our children the stories of failure. And we have a happy ending, but we leave it as long as possible. We want them to sleep at night. But actually, fairy stories are designed to terrify the hell out of the little shits so that they behave. But also, we're passing on our knowledge, not of success, but of failure. The human brain pays attention to failure. It doesn't often pay attention to success. And the reason is the avoidance of failure is a more successful evolutionary strategy than imitation of success. We now don't do things like corporate vision statements or common purpose statements, and by the way, they're not any different. We used to have mission statements, value statements, purpose statements. Yeah, if you don't know it yet, the next one out is Deep Purpose. The book has been published. The consultants are winding up. All of them are the same group of platitudes, just arranged on the same sheets. There's no difference across it. We actually create stories about what we do not want to be as an organization. That's actually far more effective. It gives a better control mechanism, and it corresponds with the way we grew up. The stories we always tell are the stories of what we don't want to be, rather than what we do. Worse practice systems convey more learning than best practice systems. We can use fictional story to get people to speculate about failure, and that creates far more learning than stories about success or case studies. Fiction evolved effectively to speculate about things that could go wrong. And that story element of his key, the vital element, and this is really a lecture for another day, but the main focus we worked on when we worked on narrative, and you see one of our projects in Africa there, is allowing people the right to interpret their own story. Because power comes in the person who interprets the story, not the person who tells it. And that's called epistemic justice, if you want to look at it in the literature. And that's actually a really important principle in terms of the way this works. And then the third thing is the thing several people have mentioned and looked at me with a slightly guilty sense throughout this conference, which is the whole thing about complexity. Now, if you don't know the origin of the word complex and complicated, they used to be considered synonyms for anybody into theory of constraints. Goldratt actually uses them as synonyms. You can see that, and he puts the two words in the same sentence to mean the same thing. Yeah? Um, a lot of us, several years ago, started to distinguish them. We all, all did it from different backgrounds. One well, of the reasons for that is the Latin root. The Latin root for complicated is about enfolding things. And of course, if you fold something, you can unfold it. It stays the same. The Latin root for complexity is about entangled things. And of course, once something entangled, it's never the same if you actually change it. And because of the level of entanglement, there's no linear material causality. The same thing won't happen again the same way twice except by accident. Effectively, it's a science of constant novelty. Now, that actually is quite exciting because it gives us many possibilities. A lot of people confuse chaos with complexity. 
I've seen people say traffic in Mumbai is chaotic. It isn't. It's actually complex. If you walk in a straight line across the street, nothing will hit you. And if you want a tip, has anybody driven in Italy, south of Naples? Okay, th this is an interesting experience. I remember hiring the car at Naples Airport and driving into Naples on the sat-nav, uh, which you should never do in a foreign city because you generally end up in areas where you realize you don't want to be seen there because it could get dangerous. And the traffic lights started to change color to red, so I did the British thing and slowed down and stopped. And I heard this mass set of crashes behind me. Uh, nobody hit me but the reaction time because the informal rule in Naples is go faster and get across. So I got out of that and then drove from Sorrento down the Olfini coast, which is a truly terrifying experience because Italian drivers pass you on both sides in lorries and motorbikes. I gave up on any attempt to park because it just wasn't possible. Got to the end and thought, thank God there's a tunnel, I'll be back on an Autostrasse and it was closed, so I had to execute a three-point turn which, shall we say, took 30 minutes with aggressive Italian drivers moving around me at much higher speed, and I followed a dirty lorry all the way back. And I was complaining about this at an annual conference I go to at Lake Garda, and one of the Italian academics said, well, you don't realize, they flock. And actually, the way they drive is follow the next car, match speed, avoid collision. And if you actually drive in Southern Italy on that principle, it kind of like works, it's stress-free. But the point is, that's a complex system because simple rules are governing the output, which is always going to be slightly different. It's not a chaotic system. Right? So complex systems are entangled, but we can manage them. Uh, the origin of the word manage in English as well is interesting, by the way. Um, it comes from an Italian. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce Italian because I really am very bad at it. Right? Um, it comes from the Italian word which is how to ride a horse in dressage. It then gets corrupted by the French. Uh, many words have been corrupted by the French, not as many as by the English, but many, to mean household management. Yeah, so we now talk about menage or manage. Is it about riding a horse? It's complex. Or is it a household budget? It's complicated. So I'm giving you some metaphors and examples to explain this. And actually, complexity can be managed, but it can't be managed in terms of output. So if anybody talks about measurement and says we need to move from outputs to outcome, they still haven't got it. Sorry, you can't determine an outcome in a complex system. The thing you can measure is what's called a vector. Am I going in the right direction at the right speed with the right resources? So we can set KPIs in complex, but they're based on direction of travel not actually on outcome in terms of the way it works. And by the way, that gives agile development teams huge potential to change their relationship with their users by not defining outcomes, but by agreeing directions of travel with stages. That's actually a much more successful strategy because it opens up various possibilities. And the key thing to understand about a complex adaptive system is that it's dispositional and it has propensities. So I can measure the dispositional state. I can say, given the current environment, the system is disposed to behave in this way. And I can say elements of the system have propensities, i.e. they're always going to work in roughly similar ways. So I'm starting to identify points of certainty within the actual system. The other thing I can do is to map constraints. Now, I'm not going to talk about this today, uh, but there are three major frameworks within the company I run, Kinevin, Flexus Curves, and the new one is Estroin Mapping, which, to be honest, I'm more excited about than I am about Kinevin, um, because actually it's a new complexity approach to strategy based on quantum mechanics. So that we're actually about to put up in the wiki and launch, um, but that's coming downstream. But what that is basically about is identifying the constraints and identifying which constraints will change and which won't. So we're about mapping the space in which you operate rather than trying to decide where you would like to go. What's the space of operation? What are the feasible routes of travel to go? And again, that sort of feeds into software design and military strategy and everything else. So if you want an example of a dispositional map, this is one. 
This is actually a cultural audit. We've gone to every member of the company and we've asked them what story they would tell their best friend if that best friend was offered a job in the company. That's called a non-hypothesis question and it gets a rich narrative. We then got them to interpret that story and we use what's called high abstraction metadata. Uh, you can't afford for anybody to know what the right answer should be. Yeah, because then you can trace input to output. This came from our work in DARPA on counterintelligence before and after 9-11 and then with the Singapore government where we built their risk assessment and horizon scanning system and that actually funded the setup of my current company in terms of the way it works. So this is a dispositional map. Now, if you look at this, and if I had the eye pencil, I could draw, but I can't, you actually see that in the top right hand, there's a sort of outlier cluster. Remember the 17%? That's different. And you can see two dominant clusters in the center. So this is an organization with three clusters, yet two of which are connected, one of which is an outlier. It's not a single culture. Right? I'll go show you some more maps on this later. If I want to change that, so let's suppose that top right, let's take a classic two by two, and assume I want to go towards the top right, I can actually use this to say, hang on a minute, where's what we call the net that you're adjacent possible? I can't get everybody up to the top right, but there are stories closer to where they are, and literally you click on it, read the stories, and say, what can I do to create more stories like those and fewer stories like these? We're now doing that on a distributed basis with Scrum teams by which they capture stories every time they interact with the user. We look at the patterns of the user stories from which we can measure the impact of the Scrum team, but then we can sit down with the team and say we want more stories like these and fewer stories like those, and that can engage anybody without any feel of guilt because the origin is there. That's a whole new theory of change, by the way. It applies to cultural change as well. What we effectively do is we micro-nudge. We keep doing small nudges in the right direction, we constantly measure, and if it's going in the right direction, then we reinforce it. We don't start off by declaring what sort of culture we want to be, because that won't work. Yeah, there's an old argument in anthropology, the minute you make something explicit, you've lost it. Because now everybody will game it. Yeah, I've survived corporate life in IBM and elsewhere, all you do is monitor what's the latest buzzwords that McKinsey's have brought to the board, and you use find and replace on your business plans to use those buzzwords. You don't actually change. Right? And again, that's kind of like an approach. We're trying to get away from that sort of lack of authenticity. So that's an example of a dispositional map. It actually comes from fitness landscapes in biology. Um, for anybody interested in Kanban, our next big research project in Kanban is say the idea of restricted work in progress is a universal, but Kanban represents it as a complicated flow. This is potentially the alternative representation for work in progress in a complex world because it gives you more flexibility. So there's a lot of exciting new things starting to come out of this for anybody who wants to be involved. So that's really trying to get you to understand complexity, but also understand that there are things we can do to manage it. Now, there are three basic rules, divided this years ago, three basic rules that you do if you're in a complex space. These are questions you ask yourself. Uh, just to be clear, there isn't a recipe for complexity, but there are heuristics, and we really want chefs, not recipe book users. Heuristics capture human knowledge really well, as do habits. The first is you need to get the granularity right. Small things will combine and recombine very quickly, whereas large things won't. There's nothing wrong with hierarchy. You're going to have a hierarchy in an organization. You can't avoid it. If you try and remove the hierarchy, the alpha males will create one anyway, and you definitely don't want that, or the alpha females will, and you absolutely don't want that one um, in terms of the way it works. So you might as well have a hierarchy which is open, but different sorts of organizational forms can start to form. So small things which can combine and recombine in different ways. I'm giving a one-day workshop for the Carter Center at George Washington in, in, New, in the States shortly. One of the things we're working on is peace and conflict between people from radically different political backgrounds. If you cook people from different political backgrounds together in groups of less than five, 
and you give them work to do, they can have a conversation about their political differences. If you bring them together in a workshop, then they'll form into their tribes. And just by the way, open space is a very, very poor, agile technique. Because it puts everybody into a big room, it allows them to organize in tribes, and if you haven't worked out a game it yet, the law of two feet is the worst possible thing, because it means anybody who says anything which is controversial doesn't get followed, and you can see that pattern emerging. I'll talk about alternatives in a minute or two. Yeah? Fundamentally, granularity matters. Think about it. Social media, things spread very quickly. Documents don't. Individual words, too small. This is kind of like a Goldilocks strategy. Working out granularity is a key skill in managing complexity. The second thing is you need to distribute and diversify cognition. Remember the 17%? All right, well, I use the whole of my workforce to, as a real-time human sensor network. Every time I have a problem, I present it to them. They reply within five minutes. I can produce maps. Those maps give me an evidence base. And I will find people who think differently. I don't take people through a rational, structured, linear process because we know that will result in the wrong sorts of bias in terms of the way it works. And the final one is disintermediate decision makers. Now, I'm going to say this now because Ron Jeffries also agrees with me, and if you don't know, Ron and I are having a competition as to who is the worst curmudgeon in the Agile community. Uh, both of us secretly want to be it, but we're both trying to pretend the other one is. Right? And Ron himself has abandoned story points. Story points put too many mediation levels between the end users and the coder. We actually gather user experiences and anecdotes as micro-narratives and we give coders clusters of micro-narratives without any interpretation. And then we re refresh those as they start to push code out to them. Yeah? Decision makers go directly from a representation of the total space to the stories of their customers without secondary levels of interpretation. This intermediation is a key aspect. So if you learn nothing else from the lecture, yet remember those rules because they're absolutely critical. Right, three more bits of science just to give you. Aesthetics, All right, art. If you don't know it, art and music came before language in human evolution. Yeah? Now actually, they probably develop in a primitive form, but then they develop to the advanced heights. I will be in Berlin shortly to do a series of workshops. Um, it's just a coincidence that there's a Wagner ring cycle. Uh, just the way it worked out. It was an accident, but I've got the opportunity, right? Some of my best ideas on Kinevin, the liminality thing, was introduced when I was with my daughter looking at Caravaggio's Seven Mercies in Naples and suddenly realized the nature of liminality. The role of art in human evolution is to break us away from the material so we see novel connections. Yeah, art is actually fairly critical to human inventiveness which is why a lot of us are worried about the excessive focus on STEM education. Yeah, because it puts you into a logical, structured way. So aesthetics is key. And what it is, remember I talked about high abstraction metadata? We're now getting people to interpret their stories into symbols and pictures, not words. Because if we go up a level of abstraction, we'll get novel combinations. Yeah, so the aesthetics is absolutely key. So that's one. Second one. Exaptation, which follows from it. Now, this is actually really important. Liz Keogh has got quite a good lecture on this as well, and with a lot more examples than I'm going to give you. Dinosaurs you know, all had feathers, if you don't know it, and the feathers were very colorful. We know that from the findings in northern China. And it looks like they evolved primarily for sexual display. And then a small dinosaur developed skin flaps under their forelimbs to better display the feathers, roll like a peacock. And they were more prey than predators, so they had to run very quickly. As they ran, they put their forelimbs out, they glided, and that's how we got flight. Dinosaurs couldn't have developed flight, you know, if they threw themselves off cliffs in the hope of evolving feathers before they hit the bottom, it probably wouldn't work. So a trait which involved under linear conditions for one function under stress, exaps, it doesn't add up for something completely different. 
The cerebellum at the base of your brain evolved in higher apes to do fine-grade manipulation of muscles in fingers. It then exaps in humans to manage grammar in language. The huge sophistication of grammar couldn't happen in a linear way. It required a non-linear repurposing. In fact, most of your higher functions evolve for something completely different than what they do now. IBM dominated the computer industry because they were the world wide market leader in punch card machines to control industrial sewing machines. So they took that technology and applied it and got early dominance. If you look at the history of Apple, they take things developed for one function. So for example, IBM developed a device which detected if your ThinkPad dropped. Apple took that and created the mechanism to reorientate your screen. That's called acceptation. Yeah, and actually, one of the things that really good innovative companies do is they find things that other people have invented or they know, and they use them for something different. Microwave ovens, a chocolate bar melted in an engineer's pocket, he realized the significance, so he put a metal box around the magneto in a radar machine. That's how we got that technology. So most human, most human innovation is acceptive, and some of our work, and I'll talk about this briefly on design, the next approach to design thinking beyond the double diamond, is to create acceptive moments in which existing capabilities are thrown together with unarticulated needs. Because if you can use something you're already good at to meet a requirement which hasn't been formally stated, you become a strategic business not just a responsive manufacturing business. And that moving into that strategic slot is actually quite key. And then the final one I want to point, because I'm going to rely on all of these yeah, in the next couple of slides, is the point I already made, the post-Cartesian understanding of consciousness. And the problem is that we've got locked in to this ever since Descartes. The reason Descartes separated the soul from the body Actually, it was to be avoid being burnt alive. For some reason, he didn't want to go through that. So he created a space for science separate from the space for the state. That's actually where it originates. But it's really locked in. Yeah, you know, it's, people keep talking about things like mindset. They talk about the mind and the body. You get people who actually think computers can replace our bodies. I famously said in California, if anybody genuinely believes that, their brain is probably ossified to the point where for them it may be possible. I didn't know that Kerwin was in the audience, but that's another story. The reality is your consciousness is effectively chemical in your body as much as in your brain. You can't replace that functionality. Now, understanding that the other element on this is, is key is the stories which are told actually are part of us. It's what Andy Clark calls scaffolding. We create these social structures where we store knowledge in common stories and common beliefs. Yeah, if we go into the current conflict in Ukraine, yeah, Putin is working off this abstract concept of Rus, which goes back to his origins in the Russian Orthodox Church. It's a narrative from which he and two or three other people can't escape. Look at what happened around Trump. Narratives form patterns that enable and constrain. Yeah, we never make decisions on them independently in the way. So hold those, because I'm going to use them now as I run through some more material. I'm trying to mix a bit of theory with practice here. So, we talked about Renaissance, not Enlightenment. There's another key phrase we're using, which is coherent heterogeneity. And this is against the idea we should all have the same values. The idea we should be all aligned with the same values is never going to happen, which is the good news. If it did, the system would lose variety and it would, wouldn't work. Now, the best way I know of explaining this, as some of you know, I'm Welsh. Yeah? Uh, rugby is a religion where I come from. I support Cardiff. Cardiff is a highly intelligent team of players, much put upon by poor referees. As spectators, we're really intelligent audiences. We cheer the opposition when they do well. Yeah, we're a good team. And there are those bastards down the road in Llanetli. Yeah, they play in red. They can't be trusted, all right? They absolutely can't. They, we call them tin men, all right? Um, yeah, they, bar, you know, they barge in, they break the rules, the spectators are partisan, can't stand the buggers until the English arrive, and then we're all Welsh. <laughs> now, that's called coherent heterogeneity. It's the ability to be different and the same in different contexts. 
And trying to eliminate those differences is actually really dangerous. So all this common mission, common values, just destroys what's called requisite variety, and you lose innovative capacity in terms of the way it works. You need to be able to bring things together in different contexts and different circumstances. Which is why, by the way, some things work in a crisis, but don't work when the crisis is over, because in a crisis, the context has made, made things different. So, you can see why we don't like mindset. And you know the way mindset works. I had this wonderful Agile program. I got executive sponsorship. We chose the right framework. It didn't work. Your mindset was wrong. That's how it works. All right? The fact is, there's no such thing as a mindset. Yeah, we, we talk about agency. What has agency? Yeah, what are the affordances provided by people's education, the business context? What are the assembly structures, the patterns of the stories which determine the way people think? That's called the three A's. If you actually address those, you can make a difference. If you talk about mindset, it's meaningless. The same with mental models. There are no mental models. That's not the way we make decisions. That's the way computers make decisions. But it's not the way that human beings do it. And if I see one more bloody iceberg in an agile presentation, I will go quietly insane. Right? <laughs> right. Rethinking user interaction. I'm going to run through three methods here. And by the way, these are all in the open source wiki. We made the big decision just over a year ago to put every single method we had in open source, and that's actually paid off hugely because the community are contributing to it. So one of those is called Entangled Trios. Now, this is something we use in citizen engagement and elsewhere. So we're doing pioneering work at the moment in places like Malmo and Wales and Colombia, where we're actually getting school children to act as ethnographers to gather the stories from their communities. That makes teachers very happy because it's a tick in the box on the education program and nobody refuses a kid on a school project so we get much better data. Yeah, then a minister looks at the maps, you saw a dispositional map, and says, I'd like more stories like these and fewer stories like that. So then we put together what are called transgenerational pairs Somebody very young with somebody in their retirement age, that's young and bright together with old and networked. Oh, and by the way, between about 25 and 45 to 50, you're unlikely to think very differently. Innovation tends to be younger or older, uh, and there are reasons for that which are chemical triggered. Yeah, during that sort of 25 to 50, 45 period, you've got to hunt for the tribe, so you've got to conform. If you survived into your late 40s, 50s in a hunter-gatherer community, you've obviously got something about you, but you can't lead the tribe anymore, so you go into the wisdom business, right? Um, so that's kind of like we put those pairs together. If they generate a good idea, we put them in a trio with somebody from local government who can make the idea work. So we end up with two or three hundred micro-initiatives rather than a grand politically-driven initiative, which is probably going to fail. In Agile, what we're now doing is putting young, bright coder together with systems architect or end system tester, somebody who's got the bigger perspective, together with user trained to talk to IT people. It's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than train IT people to understand users. Now we're going to launch that training shortly online for people to use. So instead of sending out a systems analyst who will only see what the analyst expects to see, or have a large group facilitation where the norm will form very quickly by anybody, yeah. Large group is great if you don't upset people. If you upset people, you get excluded. Yeah, so instead of that, we throw 15 or 20 trios at a problem, see what they come up with. We fuse that together, and that goes into backlog. So you see me taking that science and now applying it into a method, and by the way, that costs significantly less than a traditional approach and actually reduces risk. Yeah, triple eight, that was originally from the DSDM days. If you don't know, I was one of the three founders of DSDM. But we founded DSDM as a collaboration between competitors. We never made it proprietary. I think that's actually when Agile went wrong. Most of the things were proprietary. They weren't collaborative. I'll talk about that in a second when I finish. So basically, the way triple eight works, it's a JAD. Everybody's forgotten about JADs. Anybody worked with a JAD? Joint application design workshops? 
I find it really amusing when people are, are, re are rediscovering this stuff 20 years later and giving it fancy names involving lean, right? Um, the reality is we used JADS for procurement in 1996 with the stock exchange. Over two years, we ended up with the best and final offer at about 5.6 million, and the stock exchange signed it on the spot at the end of the workshop. IBM general manager almost fainted, all right? Because we shared the risk premium when we collaborated on requirement and, and offering. So JAD was a highly orchestrated dance, and there's lots of work we can do in that field. Um, when I did that, we started to use it for requirements capture, and one day I was under huge pressure, so I wanted to do three time zones. So Farnborough, eight hours, Mumbai, eight hours, San Jose, eight hours. All right, and the idea was we'd work in Farnborough, we'd hand over the user requirement, we'd hand over a prototype, they would further enhance it, and then they'd hand over to the States, we'd get it back the next day. And by the way, that works quite effectively. But the first time I did it, I forgot to hand on the user requirement. And I remember waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning going, oh my god, I'm in trouble. Uh, so I sort of staggered in the next morning to discover the user sat around the screen saying, oh my god, I would never have thought of that. But actually the fact that the two other teams didn't know what the users wanted meant they had to guess. So we got more variety into the system. And we've actually had that result every time we've run it since. And again, you see what I'm doing? I'm building that cognitive dissonance, that variety, before we move things into a backlog to make sure I don't miss stuff. And then the Gamba work we're doing is basically giving users, or a sample of users, continuous capture of frustrations, experiences, problems, ideas. And then when we see statistically valid clusters, we hand them over to a prototyper who builds something and says, would that help you? Remember I talked about unarticulated needs? Having a small amount of your IT budget working on that process means you can solve problems before they get declared. Now, there's other methods, but I'm giving you those ideas as sort of some of the things we're working on. Next up on that, uh, I've just talked about that, design and procurement. Yeah. Now, the key thing on complexity, if anybody wants this, I'm going to document it shortly, is it's not that you get everybody to fill out a form and compare the results. The way I ran it when we ran the stock exchange, and I did loads of these, is I had multiple teams. We broke the problem down into component parts. Different teams worked on different parts in parallel. If it was complex, we'd have three teams work on the same problem in parallel, not together. But they were always joint teams between, between both sides. I had behind me, electronically, the whole of the stock exchange staff where I could ask questions in real time. And then I had IBM estimators on standby or call out on half an hour because I didn't know what resources I needed. We actually built a dedicated facility for this so we could move people quickly through the process. So there's also lots of things you can do if you actually get that force interaction. We also use that a lot for estimates. I think the two most successful software projects in my life is where I got involved in the bid at the last minute and had no time to do a proper estimate. So the way I actually did it is what can we deliver? I can get five teams together, five teams can deliver this sort of thing. Well, now we'll spec on that. So we actually estimated at a team level. We didn't estimate at a delivery level. And then we used time boxes with minimum maximum delivery, minimum maximum resource to actually get people to self-organize to achieve those goals. Yeah, and there's a whole body of stuff on estimating there which people really should go back to because that was all part of the sort of early movement back in the 90s and the turn of the century before the manifesto in terms of are we getting the granularity of estimation right? Because if you break things down and build them up again, you add too many risk premiums. Everything has its 5% and projects get out of hand in terms of the way they work. So a couple more things, then I'll finish off and be roughly on time. So, Trioptican. Now, this is something we developed. It's now there's a whole simulation on the website. It's where we're bringing three bodies of knowledge together. So, for example, I've just done one with one of the big farmers. We had IT, R&D, commercial. They have to work together, but they don't normally. So we had the most senior person in the company from each of those three groups. They're called Eagles. And then we had, you always go in groups of three. I think we had 28, but let's do 21 for the moment. We had 21 people in three groups from those three areas. 
They're called ravens. And the way it worked is the eagle one presents, the other two respond. Nobody has a dialogue, because if you have a dialogue, you don't listen as well. Right? Then the ravens go away in small groups of three, come back, and one person from each sits in the circle, discusses what they heard. The eagles have to listen to this, they can't interrupt, which is really good for them, by the way. Yeah? We've done this with leaders as well. And then we repeat twice, and then the seven groups of three become three groups of seven, and they integrate the project. Now, you can look at that on simulation, but it makes this wider point I'm making. If you want to do with large groups of people, you need to create a dance in which they can't choose who they work with, they have to work with lots of different people. And I've run that up to 8,000 people. Yeah, that takes more organization, but it's not just letting people do what they want to do, it's making sure that people from different backgrounds in small groups interact with each other so you get diversity into the system. But it's staying nearer this. Estimates I've talked about. Distributed decision-making. Um, give you an example on this. Probably this is the last thing I'll do as a method. So when I was a general manager, I was called in by the managing director one day, and he said, I want you to write the ISO 9001 manual. Uh, anybody written an ISO 9001 manual? Yeah, it's the quality control one. And I said, why are you asking me? I mean, normally you beat me up for not following the rules, so why are you asking me to write them? And he said, poachers make the best gamekeepers, or you know, thieves make the best cops. He said, you might write something which the rest of the company will follow. I, if I give it to quality control, it will be a 15-volume book, a three-week training course, and I have to double the size of quality to get us through the certificate. So either I wrote 78 pages, I was still programming then, so it was a series of do case statements. Yeah, if this happens, we do this. If this happens, we do this. If this happens, we can do this or this. That's clear and complicated in Kinevin terms. If anything else happens, you assemble people from these three roles with these three qualifications, they decide what to do a minute it. And that got us through. Now, I didn't know about complexity then, but that was a complex technique. Where we know what to do, we define it. Where we don't, we create a process with sufficient diversity to make a decision. We also had another manual, which is the general managers who couldn't be trusted to answer questions from quality control inspectors. Um, they were honest in the wrong way, right? I mean, there's ways you don't have to lie, but there's ways that you explain things, right? And because we were a secure site, if anybody inspector arrived, we could withhold, you know, the security guards were instructed to give us 10 minutes by challenging their credentials, and we had an evacuation plan by which all those general managers left the site. So their nominated deputies who were trained to answer questions from quality inspectors could deal with it. Again, I'm giving you some ideas about how you really manage corporate life, right? Um, you make your life easier. So we're now using that for decision making. We've done it for safety. Yeah, if, you, if these three roles agree, you can break any rule provided it's documented and transparent. And then we now use it in military terms because it's not delegated authority, it's distributed authority. So decisions can be made very quickly in the field and then reported back within Gemba systems. And again, that's starting to change the way we think based on the sort of scientific approach. And I won't go through that because I need to finish. If you haven't seen the EU field guide, um, that came out recently. All right, that's, yeah, I, I was the principal author on that, along with Alessandro. That's actually, you can download for free from the EU website. Yeah, that actually contains a lot of what I've talked about. It's the first government publication based on complexity theory. And it has those three things I've already talked about. Build a human sensor network, build informal networks, and focus in effect, yeah? Um, on acceptation. So the final thing I want to talk about, I want to do design thinking, is this. We got really fed up with the framework wars. So what we're starting to do with a body of allies, and this is an open source movement, we've already published the standards, we've removed all of our branding for it, is to actually create an open source approach to Agile. And we're not creating a framework, we're creating an ecology into which all the frameworks can be fitted. And you can see the hexagon approach, by the way, that's actually fairly critical. This is the stuff we've been doing with Ivor Jacobson, in essence, to take his material across, which is one of the first ones. 
So any framework or any material gets decomposed to the optimal level of granularity and put into the framework. Hexagons, by the way, people put them together in novel forms. Each of those hexagons has a QR code on it, which goes to the person who owns the method, not to us. Yeah, so the point about this is to create an assembly structure, but it means I can peel out, for example, a sprint from Scrum and replace it with a three-month time box from DSTM. So the idea is to create an environment in which people can put things together in different ways and different combinations, and we also have those are all marked and coded based on difficulty in training and everything else that you need to do. So if anybody's interested in this, you know, the big launch is probably coming up at Agnostic Agile, in November, where I and others are speaking. Uh, we're building the partnerships at the moment. We've already got XP lined up, we've got Scrum lined up, and so on and so forth. The idea is to create an ecosystem in which lots of different things can come together without any judgment about what's right or what's wrong. And effectively let people pick and choose what will work for them in context. So I thought I'd finish with that, because that's me taking complexity theory but also saying the last thing the organ anybody needs at the moment is another proprietary framework. We need an open standard which allows us to combine from different sources, and that's managing for complexity. So, I'm exactly on time, so thank you very much for your time. Sorry about the interruptions at the start, but that's it. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, we still have a couple of questions we would like to ask you. So the first question is, uh, you mentioned you are not very fond of open space. So mm -hmm. if not open space, then what? Well, I just gave you an example. Trioptican does it. We also do large group facilitation. I mean, we've, we've actually done that for the last one I did was educational policy in Northern Australia, where we literally have people, lots of people in groups. They do a task for 20 minutes. Then they're broken up and regrouped. They do another task for 20 minutes, they're broken up and regrouped. So nobody gets to choose what they work on, and nobody gets to dominate the teams. Mm -hmm. And at the end of two days, we end up with a wall with eight or 900 micro projects, and we also put those through multiple rounds of ritual descent. So there are alternatives, Trioptican is another one. And by the way, open source works quite well if you just want consensus or get people together. It just doesn't work if you've really got a difficult task to handle. Thank you so much. Uh, we got a lot of questions about the dispositional map. Uh, so I think the most voted one, what are the axes in the example? Ah. Because there are no axes. Tell us that. Okay, so in the example I gave you, there's only a Z axis. Right, that's a true fitness landscape. So the way we do it is normally we give people, say, six triangles. So one triangle, let's take the employee satisfaction one, might have the manager's behavior is altruistic, assertive, analytical. So three positive qualities. So you don't know what the answer is. Yeah, and that's actually critical. So with six triangles, get 18 data points. If everybody put their stories in exactly the same point in every triangle, that fitness landscape would just be a dot. Yeah, but because everybody's different, it spreads out. So in a true fitness landscape, you only have a Z dimension. But we also use them with XY dimensions with Boolean operators on the XY curves. And those are also very useful. So there are two types of fitness landscape. The okay. mathematics of the first is, shall we say, somewhat difficult, but um, we've got it sorted. Okay, uh, thank you. Another question would be, so the CEO in our company decided that this year the OKRs will be the quote-unquote innovation. So maybe you, you would have a storage share, Professor, where the company actually could become more innovative. Yeah, and I think we're, we're, what we're, there's another key thing we're always saying in complexity. It's both and, not either or. And this has straightened me over the years. It's like every three years there's another fad and everything we did before has to be thrown out and replaced with a new fad. The reality is the previous thing was very useful, we just took it too far. There was nothing wrong with business process re-engineering in manufacturing, there was everything wrong with it in service. And make, producing what is called six stigma in the trade, yeah, just made it worse. Yeah? So it's a both and not neither or. So what you basically say is okay, ours are great, if it's complicated and there's no human motivation involved, because if you don't know, whenever people are working for explicit goals, it destroys intrinsic motivation. I can give you the science on that. So if you don't need intrinsic, mo intrinsic motivation, have explicit outcomes. Otherwise, the fitness landscapes give you vectors. 
because I can say within the next six months, I want that pattern to shift x degrees in that direction with this intensity. That's a vector measure. So don't challenge the concept of measurement. Say we need two types of measurement. Okay, and a final question, which is actually related to Hexi. Mm. Uh, one of our uh, listeners wants to know what, in your opinion, was like the most surprising combination of the Hexis? Um, not sure, actually. We haven't got enough experience yet of, I mean, we've been using this since I was in IBM um, as an approach. So we this has been developed over about 20 years. We use it for our methods. I think what I'm always surprised about is hexes act as a memory device. So you all know you go on one of those courses and you remember maybe one or two things. Mm -hmm. When you're using hexy facilitation, you lay out the method sets and people go and pick things and they suddenly remember something and think it could be useful. So it forms an extended memory. And so the thing which has surprised me most is the ability of people to suddenly remember something which they would otherwise forgotten and find utility for it in combination with other things. Okay, so um, thank you so much, Professor.